everybody, and welcome to this next episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today we are indirectly talking about poetry, and it should be really good, because I think this interview with Roy Gilsdorf is going to be something that we can all learn from, because that's why you listen to podcasts, to learn something and expand your mind and edify your brain and tinkle your taint, okay? So before we get into the actual interview here, what I would like you to do, if you haven't already done it, run over there and give this podcast a five-star rating wherever you listen to it, if that's something they allow you to do. If you were just watching this on video on the YouTubes, go ahead and give it that big-ass thumb. Stick it right up like you're hitchhiking and you want to get picked up. Show a little leg. You know how it goes. If you want to know how to be able to watch this instead of just listen to it, if you go to my YouTube channel and click the join button for as little as $2.99, you can watch me sitting here with no shirt on making chili while talking to you guys here from this lovely kitchen in scenic Bangladesh. Okay, well, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So go over and um, join Patreon if you don't want to do the YouTube thing. No harm, no foul. You won't be able to see me, but you'd be helping. So that's good. And speaking of people who fucking help, let's get to those Patreon and YouTube shoutouts. So first off, for my patrons, 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 I want to give a big thank you to Michael, to Cedar, and to Harry. And I'm not going to say this again, guys. If your name wasn't called, your card got declined. Get with the show, Graham. And then for the people over on YouTube, I want to give a big thank you to AM, to Patrick, and to Alan. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. It means so fucking much to me. I appreciate you so much. And now... For the big swinging dicks in the Anarchy Crew, the ones who swing for the fences and knock the balls over walls, you know who you are, but I'm going to fucking say it anyway. So I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Thomas, to Tim, to Lisa, get well soon, to Josh, and finally to Jessica. Thank you guys so much for your support. And I hope you are getting a lot out of this. So, without any further poo let's talk about what we're going to be talking about on today's show with Roy Gilsdorf. So, we're going to be talking about his book, Aphasic Tongues. Now, this was a really interesting thing that happened because he reached out to me and explained what his book was. And at first I was confused as to why um, he was asking to come on my poetry podcast. And then he started explaining it a little bit more. And I was like, oh, I understand. So basically, we're going to be talking about how poetry, writing poetry, helped him finish writing a novel that he had been working on for 20 years. Roughly 20 years. Um, It's actually a really interesting story. And the cool thing about his book too, um, that we talked about when we weren't recording, um, but I wanted to share it with you because I thought it was so fun is that the chapters in his books are broken up into like tracks on an album and the parts in the book are broken up into like side one side two, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, so that was actually super cool. And the, characters in the book um one of them like works at a bookstore one of them's in a band and um i don't want to give too much of the interview away but a lot of the poetry that he was writing to help him get into the flow of writing the novel he actually ended up putting into the uh, book and it the poetry the songs like move the story along 
in between. So it, it's, it's really interesting. I really dig it. Um, but we also talk about how hard it is to write your first real novel. Um, we talk about poetry as an art form. We talk about purple prose. And um, we kind of end everything talking about the importance of connecting with emotions when you're writing. Your emotions, your reader's emotions, your character's emotions, and how all of these things work together. So it was um, a really fun interview. We talked for um, a really long time, but it was one of those things where we were both going all over the place talking about stuff. And so it, like we'd be talking about one thing and then turn and start talking about something else and then turn and start talking about something else. So I tried to put it together um, as straight of a line as possible for you guys. So hopefully um, you can pick up on what we're putting down there. Um, the other thing too that I wanted to hit on, we, we talk about it right at the beginning, but um, just in case it's unclear, um, Roy is his pen name and Jimmy is his name. And he doesn't care that I call him Jimmy or anything like that, but I know him as Jimmy. So when we like are talking, I, I pretty much cleaned it all up, but that does come up right at the beginning. And it was right when I started recording. So there wasn't like a whole lot of like build up to it. But the first thing you were going to hear is uh, the part of the book where the title comes from. And then we um, talk about his pen name and then go into um, why the book is called what it is. So with that said, here is Roy Gilsdorf. Nell's breath is pleasant, like cooling black tea in heaven. Our touch, a great anticipation, but long delayed surprise presses on her unhurried lips. She slips slowly along my aphasic tongue as if raw deific nectar and honey flows from hers so that it numbs the mind dumb in awe. The contours of her hips are cool as windswept silk on my fingertips. Her chestnut hair smells of well-known garden honeysuckle. A petal softness solace, it all shades my thoughts like eyelids I'd rather not open except to look into her keen blue eyes time and again. Roy is my pen name, but I go by Jimmy. The reason why I chose Roy was because of my grandfather. Yeah. So it's my mom's dad. And I never got to meet him. And she's always just like, oh, you look like him. You share certain mannerisms and so on. Sure. And so, forth. so it's a tribute to him. Why don't we get into like what we were just about to get into a minute ago when you were talking about your book and what it's called and what it means oh, yeah. and everything like that. Well, aphasic tongues, it was originally just this adjective that I found on a medical condition. So Bruce Willis is currently suffering from aphasia, which has taken him out of an active movie career, which has gotten him to do that deal where he, he allowed, he sold his image for the deep fake company. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, aphasic is just the adjective of describing that the person has that difficulty with communicating, whether it's their thoughts or their emotions or whatever. It sounds like something that would come from like a stroke or something. It does sound like it. Um, it's his loss of ability to understand or express speech caused by brain damage. Oh, so okay. it could come from like a concussion or, or any oh, number shit. Of and you're right, like it it does sound like it it could probably be as a result of a stroke or any number of things that would injure a person's head. This is kind of just like where the person starts talking and then they're just like I see what you're saying. Yeah, they're they're yeah. just they hit like a uh a, a stuck point. Yeah. I thought you know, I thought there was something you know really quite you know sad about that. I was like, well. You know, there's got to be that moment of when you can't tell somebody how you feel and you want to, but you just can't find the right words at all. Yeah. So it kind of came about like that where I was, again, I, I like to play around with words a lot and just kind of look up different definitions and, and try to learn constantly. And that was just one thing that I came across that I was just like, that's really interesting. And 
a lot of these words that that like aren't traditionally in the dictionary. Yeah. When you really look into it further, there are adjectives linking to those words. So that's kind of the funny thing. I used a lot of words that are not like common. Yeah. 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 A whole a whole bunch of that. So in doing that, do you feel like you had to do a lot of research or are these just words you know because you use them all the time? A lot of research as I mean, I know a lot of stuff, but I'm not a, a wise ass. Like I need to learn it. And For it's real. not, it's not complete in, in the writing, unless you know what you're talking about. I mean, you know, that whole Hemingway iceberg theory of you better know what you're talking about. Even if you're only just mentioning it. Yeah. So one sentence can still imply an entire paragraph, but if, if you don't know what you're talking about, you still sound like an idiot using smart words. Yeah. So what was the actual inspiration for you to write this? Um, my friend Zoheb, it was in 2003, we were drunk and he said, you should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> so I just was like, okay. And the first book I wrote was just garbage. It was all just auto bio bull. Right. And I wrote that whole thing and I was like, okay, I'm done. And I printed it out after I looked it over and I was like, yeah, this is okay. And I brought it, I brought it to the next party we were at. And I was like, hey, so I ever wrote a book. And he's just flipping through it and like finding some random stories. He's like, all right, cool. Now what's next? <laughs> so I was just like, I didn't think about that. Yeah, you know, I just thought it was a one-off. Um, I, he and I had been friends since tenth grade, and so when I was around fifteen, I had started writing poetry in this five-star notebook. I filled the whole thing up, and I had gone to a couple of the the school like little poetry club meetings and stuff. Yeah, mostly because there was this little redhead that I really liked. Uh, As there always is, so yeah. much smarter than me, and so much more talented at art. I was in art class with her and this girl was just blew me out of the water in every possible way. And so I went there and heard her, you know, recite her poetry because she didn't talk very much in class. And um, I was just like, well, shit, I'm not good at this. And you are going to laugh at me. But I went up there and did it anyway. And, you know, that was there was nobody that criticized it. So I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll keep going. Yeah. This book, is this the book you started writing in 2003? Yes. This is because I wrote the first one so fast and I'd started writing another one. This is actually the third book. The other one was this science fiction thing. You know, we had been watching a lot of Cowboy Bebop and I was like, oh, Ganymede, yeah. it's a water planet. <laughs> it ain't a planet. It's the moon and who knows what's actually on it. I wrote this thing about these people living on like kind of like flotation cities where yeah. they were just giant chains anchoring them into the surface of the moon or whatever beyond the water and there was a whole bunch of like creatures in the water and stuff and it was not going anywhere fast because i wrote the outline and i was like oh that's what happens nah i don't need to write this yeah so sometimes writing the outline is more exciting than writing the book something yeah. is <laughs> yeah that's why with this one i just started writing um i was really upset when i started writing it and that's why whenever i talk about bren i kind of feel bad because i made bad shit happen to her right off the bat and if you read the preview in the amazon link i'm sorry she goes through hell in the first 10 pages it's it sucks <laughs> so I just like, you know, I was thinking like girl interrupted. Um, I don't know if I'll never tell, you know, the Brittany Murphy um, yeah, yeah, yeah. movie. Uh, I don't know if that was out by then, but it was that whole like mental institution bad shit happens. And I was like, what is the worst thing that I could have happen to another person? And I started to write it and I was like, this is, this is fucking mean. Maybe things should start getting to start to get better for this person. I started to slowly write in a better story for Brent. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm a guy. I need to write some guy chapters. I had some other thoughts floating around. So I immediately just started to flip-flop. 
So was it a thing where originally it was just going to be about the female character? And then you only had started it as that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd put her in a, a, a mental institution. It was not her fault. It's, it's weird. It kind of hurts your feelings hearing about feedback from it. I've had friends that have actually gone and they're like, have you ever been committed? And I was like, no. And they're like, I don't know how you know this stuff then. They're like, did you talk to anyone that's been committed? No. And they're like, they're kind of mad and they're kind of like impressed. They're just like, you shouldn't know this. (laughs) Yeah. It's good because they're able to connect with it. Yeah. Um, And I try to have like these little therapeutic moments throughout the book where Bren is able to come to terms with things and, and yeah, also speak to the readers that may be going through it. Yeah. And how long did it take you to write it? Too long. Um, I'm 40. And this was in 2003 when I had began. I wrote the first nine chapters in decent time. And then a lot of stuff kept happening. You know, I wanted to get a promotion at, at my job. I wanted to try to establish a relationship and then Again, and you know, you F those up several times and eventually you just kind of gave up for a while. Then we moved to Williamsburg, which is like, I guess an hour and a half away. And I got a new job and I'm working towards trying to get promoted there. I wrote like, you know, a paragraph or two while I was out there, but it mostly was left untouched. Worked a number of jobs, moving up through management at different places. Finally worked for the state liquor store here in Virginia. I made my way up to uh, assistant manager and was trying to get my own store and I quit. I had saved up money and I was like, I'm done with this. I quit. I was like, I'm going to go after doing my art. I had been years without doing any art. I don't know why I just given up every one of my hobbies, except for video games and working out. That was it. Then three months later, I realized you can't do the art that you used to be able to do as easily as you could. I sat down. Why do you think that was? I was out of practice. I was out of, I was way out of practice. I I illustrated the cover by hand though. So I, I got it back a little bit. It's funny because I used weather charts from National Weather Service and I used um, this old 1902 botanical illustration. And I put the record in there in the guitar pick and um, I did all of it by hand though. It wasn't like a simple drag and drop, like all the little letters and everything that you see on there. It's, you know, pigma microns and or sakura pins, whatever you want to call them. Um, and I did the colors and everything. Yeah, I fell out of it. And then I'd open up my laptop and I was just like, well, I have this. This isn't done. And I was reading back through it and I was like, this actually isn't bad. Because I had I'd, I'd not stopped reading the whole time. And yeah. obviously your brain's going to grow and, and you're going to understand more as, as the years go by. Yeah, I just sat down on the laptop and I was like, well, let's see how we can make it in. Because I knew where I wanted it to go. And I started writing. And then I was getting into it. And I was like, okay, all right, I've already wasted three months. You know, I just kept going. And then eventually, like, I got into chapter 18. There's 24 chapters total. So I got all the way from 9 to 18. And then I had to work again. And then it just stopped me. My brain went dead. Having to work just exhausted me. And... I had no more, I had little notes and things every now and then, but I had no more inspiration to keep writing. Um, and I know some people can do it. Some people are able to use the crap that they go through to, to filter into their work. I couldn't. Mm-hmm. So it took some time off. I reached really close to the end. So I've used the last bit of time to, to finish this out. So you were saying that, because like you sent me an email with different parts of like songs. So what was the idea behind doing that? And if you could explain a little bit about that. Well, Trevor is a musician. A big part of me writing, I'm constantly listening to music, whether it's writing or art or just sitting around for any reason. Music is incredibly important to my brain. It's in the bi- in my bio even. It says that like my ADHD locks on to music and that mm-hmm. helps calm me. It helps focus me. It helps help helps me cope with a lot of stuff. So with Trevor being a musician, I was just like, all right, cool. Like he's a musician. I've been writing poetry since I was 15. Let's see if I can 
actually study these bands and these songs that I like and try to learn something and write them as though they're actual songs. And I don't know if I accomplished that. You're the real musician out of us. Um, <laughs> yeah, they looked real to me, dude. Like dude, Creeperson is fucking nice, dude. Like, oh, I, like when you pitched it, I was just like, all right, cool, I'll check it out. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm into this. It's cool. Uh, that's cool, man. It was part of, like there's so many things about this book that that were a personal challenge for me. I was like, I'm going to do this because I haven't seen this done that well. And that was from my experience. I'm not saying that no one can do it. I was yeah. just saying from my experience, I hadn't seen first person present tense done properly. I hadn't seen music in books done properly. Unless you're reading like Kurt Cobain's diary or um, hell, even, you know, 6 a.m. Uh, Nikki Six's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. book. Yeah. So I wanted I wanted to write actual songs. I wanted to see what I could do about it. That kind of bled into everything else. Yeah, I was like, I'm enjoying writing poetry again. And whenever I was stuck, I could approach the writing process from a poetry side, where I would write a couple lines that would rhyme or have alliteration or something that really just kind of started a, a flow for me. That mm -hmm. not only allowed me to write, but I was like, hmm, this has a little bounce to it when you read. So I should just keep doing it. So I started using poetry as a way to create writing prompts for myself. And it let me just keep going. Um, and so I, I have like certain songs in there that are foreshadowing or they're tying up things that are going on. I have this very like circular writing process. My friend called it the Ouroboros and I... I could see that where it's just constantly looping back on itself. That's where a lot of it happens. Um, that first one that you sent, would you mind reading that? Yeah. I broke my wrists. I burnt my nerves. It's harder to carry the weight of the world. Please pour water over my head. I'm obsessed with voices of the dead. Lost my mind outside alone. I don't want to carry the weight of my soul. Dancing with eternal dread forever. Curse the fountainhead inoculate the innocent. From fear and falling toward descent, anoint my corpse and then withhold the secrets of my burial. It's actually one of the last ones I wrote. What do what part do the songs play in the storytelling of the book? Trevor's emotional state, um, but not only that, it it again. There are some times where there are little pieces of the songs that are foreshadowing. And then others that tie together what has already happened. Yeah. So you're getting you're getting a completely different context to the song when you first read it than when you've already read the whole book or at least like a good chunk of it, and then you go back to read it. I mm -hmm. wanted this to reward rereads. Yeah, that's fucking awesome. Was there anything about the book or the process or anything like that that you wanted to talk about that? We haven't hit. I think there's a certain illusion or disillusion that people have about writing a book. Oh, I'll just write a book and everything will work out. It, no, it won't. It's hard. Even for an intelligent person, it's hard. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. There are people that have cracked the code. They know, they know once you do the first one, you know what to do the next time. But when you first write something, it's hard. You have to figure out, uh, you know, every step of the way you can't just read saves the cat and and just follow the formula yeah that's not how it works. Uh, i think it's actually harder for an intelligent person to write a book i think it's easy maybe. shit for a dumbass to fucking write a book because like they don't have the oh this won't work this isn't how you do this you know like there's none of the what held me back yeah <laughs> I hope I don't sound too arrogant. No, no, you're you're good. You're good. So, do you think writing another book would be as difficult as this one was for you? Not at all. Have you no. started the next one? Oh yeah, yeah. I've already. I I I got like two years of notes. Is there anything else you want to tackle? Like whether it's your book or just other random shit? Since we're here shooting the shit right now. Yeah, of course. So I've been watching. Like I've been trying to keep up with. Like you have been on a tear with your videos. All these barrage of videos, I've been watching through them. 
And there was something really awesome that you had said about, um, you know, being an artist first and then going into mm-hmm. writing. I was like, man, he's right <laughs> again. <laughs> and I really, really like that. Um, and I feel like it's, it's a, you could have, you know, the, the group editing like Robert Kurvitz did for Disco Elysium and, and some of his other projects. And you could have the very so- solitary, like lonely writer process. It's not glamorous. It's just mashing. Mm-hmm. Keys. Yeah. The most that you could say about that stuff is, is that, yeah, it's, it's an artist doing their thing. And whether it's poetry or, or the kind of writer that integrates lyricism or, or poetic writing or I hate when people criticize purple prose it just sounds like an insult every time somebody says it yeah and I feel like purple prose has value uh in writing if you know how to balance it with the other stuff yeah and a lot of it too is like the voice of the writer whenever anyone talks about purple prose I automatically i don't know why but i always go to lovecraft and i'm like okay so this guy um writes completely like it takes him 15 minutes to Uh, say one little thing you know what i'm saying but that's that's his voice that's him that's how he does his thing yeah and it's one thing if you see a writer who does that one time and then never does that again yeah. Then you're like, well, like, why the fuck is that? You know, yeah. but if it's someone who is constantly doing that and that's their thing, there's an audience for that and they should do that. And the people who say, oh, I don't like purple prose and all this other stuff, then obviously, why the fuck are you reading that? Yeah, go read go it. find a good nonfiction book and give them money there. Read fucking Hemingway. You know, read something. I like Hemingway, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you don't like something, you don't have to read it. And I feel like that's probably the biggest fuck of literature. Like people say, you have to read this, you have to read this, you have to read this. And because these are classics, you also have to like these things. Yeah. But then people are like, well, I don't like this. And they make a video where they're like, this is going to be an unpopular opinion. I don't like this book. And it's like, who fucking cares? Like, read what you fucking like. Seven billion people, maybe eight soon. Who knows? And, you know, like, obviously, like, the unpopular opinion is just on the people that are talking. Yeah. We haven't heard every other person. Yeah, no sure. It's Yeah, I I really agree with, like, a lot of the things that you were saying with that. And then another uh, recent thing that you had said about poetry was, really connecting with the emotions of people you know the mm-hmm. the writer connecting with their own emotions the writer um connecting with the the emotions of the reader um and then also the emotions of the character being just as important to convey to the reader what they themselves could feel from this mm-hmm. and whether they are like with my book whether they are feeling you know angry and ready to fight somebody like Trevor or um, closed off from certain types of um, physical expression like Bren. There's, I, I felt like there were too many stories where people tried to ignore the reality of what people feel. Yeah. You could really care about something or, or someone and just not be ready to tell them, not be ready to show them. You could have somebody hug you and want so badly to hug them back and you're just stock still because maybe that touch is uncomfortable for you now. Yeah, there's a version to it. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, I don't know, like if you look at it in just very simple terms, it's like if you're telling a story or if you're like writing a poem or something like that, if there's no emotion in it, then it's just like... An instruction manual it's a yeah. technical journal or something you know it's like the whole thing that makes something a story is making feeling happen like and having the feeling be something that is universal through the writer the character the reader um i don't know like i do notice that in i don't want to say in some of the newer things i've read but like it seems like 
there's almost a trend where healing is either second or third or fourth or fifth down the list of important things that a writer needs to get across when they're writing something. That's confusing. And, sometimes. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And especially with poetry, like, because like, if there's no feeling in poetry, then what the fuck are you doing? Like, yeah. write ad copy for someone. Like, I just yeah. don't get it. And I'm not going to call out a particular person, but there are some of those big name poets that are just like, here is my stance. And you're like, okay. And then oh, like, yeah, this is, this is where I stand. And this is my platform. And, and you're like, okay. Yeah. When am I supposed to feel anything for you? Like you can't just, you don't have to feel anything. You're supposed to agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Ex exactly. You know what I'm talking about then. Yeah. What, what, what's your it. marketing strategy? People agreeing with me. That's yeah. it. Yeah, oh, fuck me, dude. So, do you have any way for people to get in touch with you and follow you and stuff like that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, on Instagram, it's just Mr. Gilsdorf. Well, thank you for wanting to do this. This is cool. Yeah, man. I had a really talking. nice time talking with you. And that was my little chat with Roy Gilsdorf. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I really dig the whole thing where the poetry was the thing that kept his juices flowing to move to the next part. Um, that's, that's so important and it's so simple, but it's something that not a lot of people think about. But I think out of anything that if you take anything from this, I want you to take from this that it's never too late. It's never, ever too late. If you have a manuscript that you've been working on for however many years and maybe haven't even opened the file in 10 years or something like that, you can go back and finish that. You know, there's, there's never an expiration date on something that you were working on. I was, in fact, talking to a dude who... Maybe I'll get him on here. That would be awesome. But I was talking to a dude yesterday, actually, who was putting together his um, first real like poetry manuscript. The first poem in it is a poem that he wrote and started reading at open mic nights back in the 90s. And the whole book like chronicles um, basically his life as a poet, you know? It, it, it's never too late to go back to stuff and do stuff with it. So if you are that person, I'm talking to you. If you have a half-written book or a book that you even finished but just never did anything with and just think, well, you know, it's kind of too late for me to do that shit now. That's all bullshit. It's never too late. You can do it whenever you want, man. Butt plugs. That's where we are now in this fucking show. Go over to Amazon and pick up my books like The End of Everything or Fingering the Mundane or any of my fiction, Black Star, Murder, the Hank Bradshaw, Dead Dame books, Zombie Zero, Black Market Blood Drive, the Shallow Jallow books, uh, the Gavel books, the Hitman ba Black books, you know, th th there's, there's books there. Go over to my Etsy shop and pick up um, my chat books like Last Chance, uh, poems about Last Chance gas stations, Blood Rag, number five, out now, nine poems, nine poets. Go take a look at that. Um, make sure you uh, like and subscribe to the YouTube or to this podcast. Again, give it some reviews because you know you want to. And share it with somebody. If you are sitting there going, God damn, this man's voice is the most soothing thing since uh, Keanu Reeves learned to act. Um, tell, tell somebody. If, if you like the sound of dirt bikes riding on city streets, you know? Like, this is the perfect show for you because I am not that good at fixing the things. But anyway, so tell a friend. Be like that redheaded chick on the old Lucky's commercials. Tell a friend. You know what I used to think she was saying? Tell a friend. Doesn't even make sense. Tell a friend. What the fuck is that? Is that like a telephone? You want me to call somebody? No. She wants me to tell a friend. 
that you get great prices at Lucky's. For those of you who were born a thousand years ago and know what I'm talking about. But anyway, so that's all fun and good and fun and good and good and fun. Oh, make sure you sign up for my mailing list so you can get that free ebook before it goes bye bye. If you want to join Poetic Anarchy, you can do so by clicking that join button under my YouTube page. And that gives you all sorts of shit. And remember, Poetic Anarchy Volume 3 is coming out this month, so that should be fun. Horrywood, my um, serial about um, confessions of a low-budget horror filmmaker, is up on Kindle Vela, if you're interested in that kind of shit. You can find my music anywhere. Um, my art, I'm going to start putting prints up soon. I know I talked about that last time. Um, and if you have any comments, any hate mail, any, um, you want to, I don't know, send me virtual brownies or something like that, you can do so at IHateMattWall at gmail.com. And if you'd like to be a guest on the show or um, you want me to come teach a workshop at whatever thing that you put together, let me know. All of these things are doable things, okay? So um, if you don't know where else to go, just go to... I hate mattwall.com and you will find links to everything and more. All right. So until next time, everybody type hard, keep on keeping on. And I will talk to you later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the anarchy crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.